Our next speaker, this is a bit like an episode from Dynasty, if you remember far, back that far. So, Ben was my student, I was Chris's student, so uh, Chris was my PhD supervisor, and it was thanks to Chris uh, that the Seabird Studies on Stonework started. And over the years, um, Chris has been responsible for monitoring um, quite a large number of species, and he's going to give us, I hope, an overview. because that was the 50th year that we visited the islands. Uh, and my thanks, I could spend the whole talk thanking people, but I'm going to restrict it to the trust, to CCW as was, uh, and also to JNCC, uh, also had a series of names prior to that. But anyway, we're very grateful to them. They've been terrific help over the years. I've had the EGI, that's my bit in Oxford, has, has had 14 students producing doctorates on birds on the, the two islands. Uh, that includes Tim, uh, who then went off and I've never managed to get rid of him properly, um, and produced three more of his own. So about seven, 17 doctorates on the birds of the three islands, the two islands, and I hope uh, that we've added something useful uh, to them. The islands, of course, are extremely important for seabirds, I don't need to tell you that, but um, they also have a very high proportion of the, uh, of the Welsh populations of, of these seabirds anyway. And this is, they're good news because the islands are safe, we hope, but they're bad news because they're, all the eggs are in one basket. And they're very close to an oil refinery, uh, and we worry about all sorts of things to do with that. I'm going to talk mainly about uh, some of the long-term studies, but also a little bit about some of the new technology which throws, evidence, throws us uh, other views of things that we've not been able to look at before. And I'm going to restrict my talk to four species because I haven't got much time. And I'm also going to um, have to admit that one of the problems about these wretched birds is that they're not too easy to count. You think you can go there and count them. Tim thinks he can count his guillemots, but they're, they're relatively easy. Um, we have to start with this bird, the Mount Shear Water. It's already been mentioned. Uh, this is the Welsh have a real serious responsibility for this bird. Of the world population of this bird, I've already said we can't count them, but forget that. Uh, something like 60% of the world population breed in Wales, or probably most, most of those on these two islands. So that's a legal responsibility we have for those, not just a moral one. Um, I said we can't count them. You can go around, they, they nest in burrows, you know that, they can come in at night. But you can go around and count burrows, uh, but the problem with burrows is they might be empty, they might have a puffin in, or a lot of them might have rabbits in. So how do you know which ones have got shearwaters in? Well, we have a rather tedious way of doing that. We, we pay the male call down the burrows, and the male incubating shearwaters don't like that, so they yell back. So we get a good estimate of how many males there are, and we can do all sorts of fiddling around to get some estimates. And we think we've got something like 300,000 pairs on the two islands. Um, in addition to knowing how many you've got, uh, almost as important as to know whether they're, what they're doing, whether they're going up or down. And that's a lot more difficult uh, because you have to have annual or regular censuses. We have some estimations uh, from the 60s that the birds, particularly on Skokum, weren't as abundant as they are now. So we think with, there's been an increase with time, um, but not a very precise one. And if I knew which button to press, is it that one? It is that one. Um, what we've been doing on SCOMA in recent years is to look at a series of study plots and play this wretched tape again and again and again until you're screaming at night. 
Um, and this has been done with a series of students over the years, and although there's wider variation than we would like, this does show a significant upward trend, and that approximates to about 2% a year. So we think they're okay, but if you look at the nesting success of them, this is the number of eggs laid that produce a fledgling that leaves the island, then they are doing significantly less well than they were in the 60s. It's not quite as good as it used to be. And in addition, we can go out uh, at night, when the, in late August, early September, and we can catch loads of fledglings sitting around waving their own wings thinking about leaving. And we can uh, ring them, but we can also weigh them. And if you weigh them, we find that the average weights of these fledglings has gone down with time. Uh, the first, the top three ones uh, are from the 60s, the rest are in this last decade or whatever it is. And you can see that the mean weight is, has dropped about 60 grams. From the 60s data, and assuming that still exists, which still holds, um, we can look at the, the chances of these chicks surviving. Uh, we have a very good set of data on the survival of the chicks over against their fledging weight. And if you put those two last figures, 425 and 485, into this, the expected survival has dropped from about 0.23%, sorry, 23% to 19%, which is a, a quite significant drop in their chances of survival. So we're not entirely sure that they're doing as well as they used to be. Ben uh, mentioned about <coughs> measuring adult survival, which we also do here. And this shows the annual adult survivals. The, the line is meaningless. It's just put there at 0.9. So you can, I find it easier to read the data if you've got a, a background there. And the, there doesn't seem to be any change in the survival rate uh, over the time that we've got on here. But in the 60s, back on Skokum, it was a little bit higher than that. So I'm then going to pass on to the next species. Most people aren't very sold on gulls for some reason, probably because they like more But the lesser blackback gull actually is our second most important bird by far. Um, if you believe the census figures that have, have been done uh, in the seabirds at sea, uh, in the seabird census in, in 2000, uh, there are about 300,000 pairs of lesser blackback gulls only, and about only about half of those are this subspecies that breeds in Britain, Grails the Eye. So there's only about 150,000 pairs of this, which on a world scale is pretty mean. And of those, uh, Wales has 8% uh, of the world population, 13% of the UK population. So these populations on these two islands are actually very significant. There, you might think, okay, they're nest in the open, they're easy to count, but Skoma is very much like that. And so there's probably a pair nesting behind this, and you can't see them. Uh, we, they are, and then the bracken comes up, and you can't count them. They are actually quite difficult to count. Uh, this is the records of the eye counts since the 60s, which is just going to vantage points and counting all the birds in each plot. But if you then take a team of people through one of those plots and see how many nests you can actually find uh, in that plot, and then look at that in relation to the ones you could count by eye, um, the figures are quite different. And so I'm going to adjust these figures for the actual numbers of birds there. And you get a, picture, a very different picture, roughly twice as many, um, varies between plots. And they increased enormously, probably due to protection on the islands, but probably also due to increase of availability of discards. And then suddenly, uh, they started to decline. The reason for that decline is still much debated. It isn't a single simple solution, or nobody's ever come up with one. Uh, certainly discards are involved in that, but there are other things as well. But now, with this crashing population, these birds are doing very badly indeed. And so badly that the adults don't even go fishing at various times. They go inland, they follow the plough, and they eat earthworms. That's okay for them. But when they come back and feed a, 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 a rather poor selection of earthworms to their chicks, the chicks die. Most of the chicks are dead by the end of a week. 
This shows the estimated number of chicks per pair per currently occupied nest, if you want the AON, um, over time. And we're looking for a stable population of gulls fledging about a chick per pair for, the, for it to be a healthy population, as they were, and as they were earlier on Skokan uh, in the 60s and 70s. And you can see that's not the case anymore. Indeed, point two means that fewer than, or any point below point two means that fewer than one in five pairs is raising a chick at all. So they're really in trouble, and it's not surprising that they're crashing. The survival rate is also going down with time. Uh, and this survival rate, the, the end here, is a good deal less than in healthy population studies elsewhere. So it's another piece of evidence that they're, they're, they're in trouble. The, fourth, the third species is the kittiwake, um, which has already been touched on uh, for Scotland. This bird is numerically on a world scale quite a bit more abundant than the ones I've been talking about. It's, very much a northern species, and it's very much a sand eel species, at least within UK waters, and it's been doing disastrously badly, and you've heard about, a little bit about the sand eels. In, in Wales it looked okay for a while, we thought they were doing all right, but in recent years it started to show a sign of a fairly steady decline. Uh, I think last year was a bit abnormal in lots of ways, but if, th there is evidence that they're declining now. If you look at the number of chicks raised per pair, that's an apparently occupied nests again, uh, although there's wide variation, there's a significant reduction in their nesting success year on year. If you look at their survival rate, um, hmm? oh, I had one on survival rates, which also shows they're going down. I'm not going to try and uh, find it again. Um, survival rates are now significantly less lower than they used to be, and in addition, they're lower than in healthy study populations elsewhere. So, guinea weights, which we thought were okay, look as if they may not be. The final species I'm going to talk about is the puffin. We have these three orcs on the, three, on the two islands. They're a very important part of the community. In fact, the puffin is probably a very important economic bird. We have about 15,000 visitors a year to the island. They're almost all centered around the puffin time. Uh, we have about another 10,000 going around the island tours. So 25,000 people coming to the islands for the puffins. If the puffins weren't there, Sarah, you'd be in trouble. <laughs> um, it's uh, another sand eel feeder. feeder. Um, it's got <laughs> um, and um, it is a major diet. If uh, in some years, then they, they will also take sprats. You can see there's a big sprat tucked in behind the sand eels there. But between these two uh, is their main their main feed. Because it nests in burrows, it's another pig to try and count. Uh, one of the ways we do it is to count all the birds around the island in the spring uh, on the surface of the water. Uh, it seems a fairly unreliable figure to me, uh, but it does show a significant increase with time, so we think that they may be doing all right. But on the land, we have a big plot with marked out pegs where we look at the productivity of the, we know how many puffins are breeding in those burrows and how many actually raise a chick, so we use it for productivity. But if you use that plot just to look at the number of burrows, you see that it, over time, actually the number of burrows in that plot has increased and the number of puffins breeding in that plot has increased. So it's a small part of the island, but it does suggest it is doing okay and it is increasing. We're using those plots, we can measure the productivity um, and uh, there's no evidence that productivity is changing with time. Survival rates are going down, and that may not seem very important, but actually 
it means in terms of the number of chicks that have to come back uh, to replace the dying adults, it's an increase of about 50% over that. So it really is a fairly important reduction in, in survival. So I'm going to talk for the, for the last few moments about um, some of the other difficulties about dealing with these birds. Um, always we're talking about land-based things. These birds live at sea. They buzz over the horizon to get their food. They buzz over the horizon for longer times when they enter the season and we don't see them again uh, until the next year. Next year. So there are important gaps in our biology. Uh, in our understanding of well. um, And these are important because we need to know where they go and what they're doing for marine nature reserves, uh, for other aspects of conservation. We need to know where they're going and what they're doing for wind farms, which are rapidly springing up all over the place. And so what I'm going to talk around now is very much work that's been done by Tim Guilford's team uh, working with us. And he uses very neat, clever, modern tracking devices to look at what happens to birds at sea. The prime one is a geolocator, which is a tiny little device which sticks to the tie to the leg, tied to the ring on the leg, and weighs about a gram and a half. It measures the time of sunset and sunrise, so you can get an east-west fix and not quite so well north-south fix. Um, and it also has with it a little device which says, I'm in water or I'm in or I'm dry. So if it's in, in the air, if it's flying, it's dry. If it's in a burrow, it's dry. If it's on the water, it's wet. So with those two bits of information, uh, we can get a lot of information out of these tracking devices. And this first one just shows uh, a very similar. This is 12 different birds, each with a different color. Uh, what they get up to uh, in the migration, in, in the non-breeding season, they go away down to South America. Okay, we knew that. They come back. Uh, we didn't know they went so far south. They come back, they go way west before they come back. We didn't know that. Um, two points from this, uh, if you're on the ball, uh, they don't uh, visit Amazonia. Uh, they don't visit Madrid. These things are not very accurate. Um, and as I said, the north-south divide uh, is not so good as the east-west. So very often, when, for example, there's a whole load of pink, pink, pinkish points in the line. They're probably not in all those places. They're probably somewhere in, in the middle of that. Um, so they're extremely good, but relatively inaccurate. Now we can go further than that, because this shows a pattern of one of these birds doing one three-day visit off of feeding trip, away from Skoma, back again. And fitted, this bird was fitted with a GPS, so we knew exactly where it was. And it was also fitted with a time depth recorder, so it recorded every dive it made. So we can then say, well, we can divide up these, these points in relation to what the bird is doing. And the flight ones are fairly obvious in light green. You know the bird is flying because it's covering quite a lot of ground, and the recorder is dry. Uh, the opposite is the case when the bird is sitting on the water, uh, the recorder says, I'm wet and it's sitting there, and it's not going very far. Uh, these long strips are here because it's just floating with the current and the tide. And so you get some very nice recordings, some nice ovals if you record them for long enough during a whole time cycle. So then you've got some mixed bird things where they're doing all sorts of things. They're in and out, in and out, wet dry, wet dry, and not going very far. Well, we think they're feeding. How do we know? Well, we know in this case because this guy has got a, a depth recorder on it, and the grey circles are around all the points where this bird was diving. So we know 98% of, I think, of all the red points are within the grey points. So we're pretty jolly sure that we can use this information to tell us what this bird is doing when it's at sea for longer periods. We don't need the GPS, we don't need the time depth recorder, so we can do it over the whole of the, the, the cycle. If we do this, we find uh, exactly what you would expect. Uh, the light greens are on the main parts of the migration. There are gaps in this, I should say, because we can't do it around the equinox, the technical problems. Um, 
when they're in the winter, when they're molting and probably not flying very much, they're sitting on the sea, but they do feed at that time as well. And um, so that fits, but notice that on those journeys, they have reds. So they're not going the whole way in one go. In fact, they take 40 days to do this trip. They may spend as much as a fortnight on one spot. So they're obviously refueling on the way up. And we didn't have any idea about this, these stopovers before. And one of the unfortunate things about these stopovers is that the individual birds don't do them in the same place, and they don't sit in the same place in different years. So from the conservation point of view, we can't easily pinpoint um, places where uh, these birds should be looked at in particular. They're, they're, they're doing it all over the shop. It's very inconvenient. Of them. This is a problem uh, nearer to home. This shows what the birds, where the birds were feeding in two consecutive years. Um, and during the time they were incubating. And here you can see uh, in 2009 they were predominantly along the Irish coast, in 2010 they were somewhere else, mainly up in the Bay of, Bay of Dundalk, which is a place that they often go to too. So again, and with some other information, other stories, uh, they don't do what you would like them to do consistently year on year. And this is the, the final one of these. Um, there are a series of Things that you can tell us, things you can do with these tracking devices on some of the posters around. I can probably answer some questions if you ask them afterwards. Uh, this is a different sort of thing. This shows from <coughs> London, Scoma, Copeland, and Rum in different colours where the prime feeding places were for these birds during the chick rearing period. And that's when they're coming back every every day or every or every night or every other night. Um, and not surprisingly, they're centered around uh, quite a lot, around near their own colonies. But the Bay of Dundalk and that Irish Sea um, front is a very important part of the, the story for these birds. Uh, a lot of the concentrate there, and we had no idea that birds from Lundy and Rum were going all the way there to fish alongside the birds from Copeland. Now, the birds from Copeland have a three hour journey. The birds from uh, Scoma and Lundy have about a 16 hour journey, and that conjures up all sorts of logistic energetic problems as to why those birds are doing that far uh, when the others aren't. And this is the sort of thing that uh, this work is throwing up. Time and time again, you find something interesting, you ask, well, what on earth are they doing that for? So, in summary, um, each year with these devices is bringing new um, devices are getting smaller, cleverer, we're knowing more of what we can do with them. Um, but we're obviously still at this stage only scratching the surface with them. They're all short-term studies, they're all very expensive, I might say. Um, and the problem with them is, as I've already said, is that they, they, the birds are not being convenient, they're not doing the same thing year on year. So we need to do these for a lot more years before we're in a position to um, be definitive about what they get up to. And because they're expensive, and because it's very time consuming work, we can only use a relatively small number of them. So they're never going to replace <coughs> the long term studies that we're doing uh, in the first part of this talk. We need both, and we need both badly. Chris, we've got time for one question. Yep. Has your team done a similar GPS local work for the puffins on SCOMA? No. Um, we're doing quite a lot of geolocator work with puffins on SCOMA. Uh, one of the posters has got some of that. Um, puffins are nasty little birds. They won't take a GPS on their back. At least they will, but they then sit by their burrow and say, oh, there we go, there again. Um, so they're rather more res restrictive in doing that. We would like to do that. Uh, we can do quite a lot from the diving and things on the geolocator on the leg, and that's okay. But wearing a backpack, not me. Okay, I think.